we finally remembered our YouTube password. Yes, we are alive indeed. And the gain is high on my mic because, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, we have had, we, 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 we where do you even we, start? We, you know, we, we lost for words. <laughs> What's that meme where the guy is like, when he's a kid, you know, the guy in the red shirt and he's trying to get his words together. We, 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 we have so much to say. I don't know where to start. We, we, uh, we, 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 boarding schools and get to podcast for full time so for us it's a hobby shots fired and so <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah for us we have other responsibilities and this is just fun portfolio of small bets shout out Taleb shout out Daniel Vasalo this first half of the year we're very busy with other things so we probably put out one episode a month at this rate <laughs> no I think it's but, two uh, yeah one or two but but the second half of this year we will be back on full track to one a week and regular publishing really if you are here for lifetime like us if you will still be here in 50 years like us doing this uh if you're a long-term thinker if you're a long-term thinker then what's six months in a uh six months of reduced cadence in a 50 60 year time span so it is what it is but thank you for your support and for the two people left who tune in and still listen to us. But we're, just to let you know, we'll be back to full uh, regular schedule in a few months. Uh, but yeah, anyway, how are things? Things are good. Things are fun. We'll be back to our regular scheduled programming. And shout out to the viewer, to the one viewer, as uh, <laughs> Fox and Son say. Yeah, all good, man. Just been just been getting some more cigars in my humidor and ready to ready to to, to light up on our next stream i think genuinely i think on our next on our next stream i think what we should do is both light up a cigar and just vibe epi2 trucks nah, dead <laughs> all right let's get serious now it's time to get into serious mode we are actually talking uh, about serious stuff so yeah this is this is genuinely it is very thought-provoking life-changing whatever you want to call it the deep life as cal newport says but um so, <laughs> it's, good, it's good we're not in person today. There's been hardcore trolling between the two of us. Trust. This this reduces a bit. I may, I would have probably slapped your neck about ten times, especially if you had a fresh skin fade. Okay, so Luke Burgess, who is a phenomenal, phenomenal writer, who wrote a book called Wanting, which we have linked in the description. You'll probably see it on the screen. Phenomenal book, which really is a great gateway or introduction to the ideas of Rene Girard and mimetic theory. You, you kind of think you know this stuff because you read it everywhere on the internet, you hear people talk about it, but really I think it lays a very strong foundation to an introduction to all of these ideas. Firstly, you should definitely read this book. Secondly, shout out to Luke actually, because just very authentically, you know, if I really like someone's content or views i'll just make a post about them made a linkedin post about him a while a few weeks ago go on twitter the next day and he's you know tweeted about me saying p.s <laughs> cyrus yari has some talebian style scorching commentary on the shark tan tankification and mimetic madness of the vc industry in his feed luke if you are listening we we will invite you later this year when we go back to regular cadence on the podcast and we have guests but why am I discussing all of this? What's what's the point of all of this? Today's discussion is another Lindy discussion. Leverage, scalable, no code. Today's discussion is another Lindy discussion <laughs> around a article that Luke has published, which we'll also link in the show notes. It was actually published two, three months ago in December, yeah. 2021. It's called 25 Anti-Mimetic Tactics for Living a Counter-Cultural Life. Elite article. We're gonna pick a few of the 25 and discuss them from our perspective and elaborate on those when you link it in with the world of entrepreneurship startups vc investing even public market investing whatever you want to call it tech or finance nothing is more relevant right now than i think the points that luke raises because you know given the usual spiel of the herd mentality group think yada yada the bs we see going on everywhere it's very rare and hard to find people who think like this and luke is a seasoned veteran he's been through the whole launch a tech startup and exit and all of that stuff but i won't give away too much because we'll save that for when we record with him and you should read his book but let's dive in man like firstly would you even because i know you went through this article 
how do you want to kick this off like what do you even make of the article Let, let's let's get into it yeah i think before we get started i think we should do a couple of things one is we should just shout out epsilon theory which are the brand or the the team that luke has written for so it's actually on the epsilon theory website and there's a bunch of people there that that talk about a lot of cool stuff so i check out their website firstly they in fact write some good things on inflation so it'd be cool to, to read up on that stuff the second thing i want to say is maybe we should start by actually explaining what mimetic theory is or who gerard was b- before we j- dive into sort of maybe some of the more detailed stuff you should give a good intro on this actually i forgot to say this is like an area where a year ago or two three years ago you researched extensively i think you actually have a lot more knowledge on this whole mimetic stuff than i do but you know the whole backstory so give us a good overview i think we've spoken about it on multiple essays that we've written so check out our essays on rationalvc.com forward slash articles one person that everyone in the tech space knows about is peter Thiel. and basically peter Thiel is famous for being a contrarian everyone knows this you know it's it's a joke at this point how much of a think boy this guy is and and uh, <laughs> how contrarian he is i mean it, it kind of escalated to the point that he supported trump and uh, you know, gave money to his, I think it was his first term, not his second term. Thiel basically has modeled everything on the on the findings of René Girard. And Girard was his professor at university. So he actually knew him quite closely and, and studied under him. You've got like a whole host of other people in tech who've come out since and have built or modeled their think boy philosophy on René Girard as well, but kind of through Peter Thiel. So you've got to give Thiel the credit for bringing Girard's stuff to the tech fore. One of these people, one of these think boys is Chamath, and he talks about it a lot on their pod, right? But My guy. <laughs> but <laughs> um, that's way below my line. But Girard <laughs> is a really cool guy. Why is he cool is because actually the guy didn't give a fuck about what most people thought. He's actually quite Talebian or Taleb is quite Girardian in the way that they think. Interestingly, not once does... Teal, even though he worked under this guy, mentioned him in zero to one, which is kind of shit. But basically, in a nutshell, what Girard's mimetic theory of desire is built on is that everybody imitates each other, but it doesn't just stop there. It's what you want, what you don't even realize that you want is built on what other people want. Everything you do is built on other people's wants and everything you aim to be is based Mm -hmm. on other people's wants. Imitators essentially seek models or idols to mm-hmm. shape their wants on. So this is this is quite important because a lot of people will say, yeah, well, I copy this guy or I use this person as a role model, whatever. That's a conscious decision. I think this is more of a subconscious or unconscious desire that we don't even realize that we're doing it. NFTs are a really good example of this, right? A lot of people yeah. just don't even understand it. They just want to make the money. And a lot of it's based on FOMO, but because everyone in the space is doing it. And then you get a couple of cool people in the space or people that you respect in the space doing it. You unconsciously think that this is now something I should be involved in and therefore I should want NFTs and therefore I should invest in da 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 It's a sliding scale as it is. There's one more thing I want to say before we deep dive into the 25, which is the way that Girard put this stuff on paper is really hard to follow. Like yep. f- philosophy in general is super hard to follow. And I studied some of it at university and it is it, it, it takes a lot of time to get your head around just one author's book, let alone work. So this falls within a great scope of work that he did. Essentially, Girard refers to something that I think is important in the context of tech, which is mimetic rivalry. Girard refers to it, I think, as mimetic rivalry, but it's essentially around copying the desires of our rivals and our rivals essentially get to you you copy each other to the point that you get to a violent end and he calls this doubling or doubles and this is all built around the fact that once you get to a point of violence or you get to a point of anger or headbutting the community that you work in the people that you're around you know the general population will always come up with a scapegoat someone who typically is innocent but that can be given the blame from both sides. So you can think of it like people doing shit to each other to a point that you get to breaking point, but then they identify someone or something to put that blame on top of. There there are multiple examples of this, but the best one is Jesus Christ, right? So Christ was meant to represent the scapegoat for humanity, and he was meant to represent the tensions that the Roman and ancient empires had gotten to by that point. And he was symbolically that person that took away those mimetic desires that uh, existed within society and therefore started afresh. It's obviously not that simple. And we go through cycles of this this mimesis 
that we, we consistently see, but essentially everything is based on this one object of desire. I'll give a couple of very quick quotes on my Kindle highlights I've pulled up from Luke's book, Wanting. Yes, apologies, I didn't buy this in hardback. I, I think it's Luke who has this fanaticism with buying hardbacks only. I agree. I don't like, I'm, I'm with it. But yes, I did get this on Kindle. Anyway, a couple of quotes like, let's link it in with the investing world, for example. One of the highlighted quotes I have from Luke's book says, who started searching Google with the words, should I, should I, in air quotes, should I received an auto-suggested completion of their question, should I buy Tesla stock? So literally just typing in should I into Google. Millions of people were searching Google to find out whether they should buy Tesla based on whether other people wanted to buy Tesla. This, in my view, is not merely informational. It's mimetic desire. And funnily enough, despite the fact that I highlighted this damn point, literally this morning when I woke up and I went about my business and then I, um, I was listening to something uh, while I was doing errands and they were discussing Tesla stock again. I was like, fuck. I was like, maybe I should now finally look into this Tesla stock because there was a period where I completely disregarded it. You probably remember where we looked into it. And then I said, nah. And then I went back and forth and then I loaded up on, I didn't really load up. I, I bought some Tesla stock. Um, and now I'm like, ah, now the price is, you know, they're talking about it's going to dip below 900. Should I buy Tesla stock? I'm like, what the fuck are you even talking about? This goes against everything that you preach and discuss and think and stand for in your values. So it really came about from in my ears, listening to a bunch of bros on a finance YouTube channel discussing Tesla stock. And so you naturally get FOMO, mimetic design, whatever, and you have to snap out of it. But that's how it links in. I'll pull up one more quote before we get to Luke's article. We are generally fascinated with people who have a different relationship to desire, real or perceived. When people don't seem to care what other people want or don't want the same things, they seem otherworldly. They appear less affected by mimesis, anti-mimetic even, and that's fascinating because most of us aren't. Facts. <laughs> facts and facts with X's. All right, let's get well, into the article. Uh, hold on, hold on. Before, before you do, search... Should I? And tell me what comes up. Should I buy a diesel car? <laughs> that's actually, that's <laughs> that's actually what it came up. <laughs> Might should I upgrade the Windows 11? Fucking hell. Yeah, that came up for me as well. Let's, let's kick into it after 15 minutes of being on the pod. We're finally getting into the real juicy stuff. What have you got for us? Stop writing to please. Number 19 on his list. This one is... I'd, let's start I'd like with to one think that's... I'm definitely one that does not write to please. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a, I think this is a really good one because all of the twenty five are basically very similar to our values. But stop writing to please is very close to our hearts. We don't write to write about stuff that's hot in the industry. We try to write Lindy shit, but we're also calling out a lot of BS, which actually has got us into a little bit of trouble from time to time. But gets you real ones following you and and, and shouting you out like Luke did you. So he's written. Writing to please is a recipe for lowest common denominator ideas and quality facts. If you're not pissing anyone off from time to time or getting some quick unsubscribers from your newsletters, then you're not actively trying to find your audience. Facts. This is literally what we built our sort of articles, our newsletters on. Like we are writing about shit that we see as being problematic. Authenticity, truth seeking, <laughs> long termism. But yeah, it is it is being authentic to yourself and calling out bullshit when you see it. And there's so much fucking bullshit in the tech space, man. It, and as 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 it becomes the common as tech becomes common ground, i.e. as all businesses become tech and the biggest businesses become tech, you're seeing more and more of this. It's becoming corporatized to an element. We've spoken about this on previous pods. Yeah. But stop it's writing to please Talib here as well. He has. He references Talib quite a few times on this in this article, and he's written as rough around the edges as Talib can be. I admire his commitment <laughs> to pissing people <laughs> off, which is true. Like the guy, the guy goes out of his way to piss people off on <laughs> on Twitter. Actually, I have a lot of friends that respect him but don't follow him as a result of his being unbearable on Twitter. But anyway, I think this was a good place to start because I think it's quite close to home for us. Agreed. Uh, I mean, I don't really have much to add when you just spit facts when Luke facts. Spits. Luke spits facts and you elaborate on the facts, then there's not much. There's only one truth, I guess. I can't really, I'm not a charlatan like most pods to, you know, there's not much to add. No comment, as Munga says. Chops. Uh, start going analog. Uh, going back to what I said earlier, Luke says, a hard copy of a book is metaphysically different from a digital one. For all of the many benefits of digital and audio books, their primary means of being acquired and read in the first place almost always driven by algorithms. You don't walk down a hallway in the back of a duty 
used bookstore on spot spine you scroll through audible or amazon or see a book recommendation online and click on a link mimesis is based into the entire experience the mimetic acceleration that technology produces is one of distraction the anti-mimetic gift of investing is more analog anyway i really really like this and he goes on and explains things like vinyl versus spotify fitness running on a treadmill through a a digital forest as opposed to a real one Um, and i guess he says you should ask yourself what price would you pay at the moment you are using a digital product to be doing the real thing we've seen this with the whole peloton craze but more importantly with people who look i don't bash these companies because uh, pro capitalism but at the same time companies like tonal who are popping up which is you stick a screen into your wall and you have these stretchy bands and you pay like how much do you pay you pay like a few grand for this machine to do supposed muscle exercises no just get your ass into the fucking squat rack and go deadlift bench squat overhead press barbell row pull up and trucks get out the gym people will troll us for like think boy but a lot of these points go back to the concept behind it all is lindy as in what he's saying is just do lindy shit let's disregard everything else Another part of this is shout out Matteo Franceschetti of Eight Sleep. We, we had he was actually the first guest we ever had on our podcast. CEO of Eight Sleep, they they've raised so much money at this point. I've I've lost track. Uh, and like the most elite Silicon Valley investors, and I really like what he's doing. I'm supportive. But he had this tweet once where it wasn't long ago. He was talking about all of the shit that you need to track with regards to your health, not just sleep, but this blood level and that blood, not like an annual checkup, but like regularly daily stuff. You need to be monitoring as if you're like a machine. And then I remember a few people came back where they were like, just they're like, why the, f- like who, who has time to do all of this shit? We're not robots. You might squeeze out an extra two years of your life with all this optimize. And I'm, I'm not one to talk about this optimize because I'm like the king of optimization, but, <laughs> but like it, it's very eye opening and, People have always recommended to me, yeah, use an aura ring to track your sleep and then you use an eight sleep mattress and then you get on your Peloton and then you use your tonal and then you drink your athletic greens and you do all this fuck shit. Nah, bro. I wake up, I drink my Iranian smoothie and I get in the squat rack. Chucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for fuck's sake. But yeah, I agree with that. I think um, a lot of everything that is anti-mimetic is anti tech to be honest with you a lot of it is anti like what's the latest craze what's the latest thing and also we're going through that great unbundling right now where everything is every product is unbundled and every product is new and niche and everybody feels the need to want to do all all of this shit but if you just stick to the basics it's just you're already anti-mimetic and like how does this link in with i mean you've touched on it with with regards to tech i guess but in terms of investing as well, the way this could be translated, I guess, is when he says start going analog is people are on Robin Hood day and night. They're not on Robin Hood, but they'll have like the Robin Hood app or free trade or whatever you have. All of these notifications will be going off, which is like price alert, price alert. This stock has dipped 3%. This stock has dipped 2%. It's gaining 1%. Do you want to buy more? Do you want to buy more? And it's like that's that goes against everything that you should be doing in investing, which is, I'm not going to repeat it, but you know what you should be doing. If you don't just, I guess a good summary is read the psychology of money. There's only one real approach, the correct way to invest. And investing is nothing technical. It's really management of emotions, as we always say. How you can link it in, start going analog. Well, what does Buffett do? I'm not saying be Buffett. Like, you know, you're going to invest in S&P 500 index. There's not much for you to do. But even let's say someone like Buffett, he reads S1s, he reads annual reports. He's not on a Robin Hood app like you degenerates with notifications going off every second where he makes rash decisions. So that's basically, there's not much more to add. (laughs) (laughs) Let's talk about, let's talk about, there's two that are quite linked, but I don't think he's linked them in his his, his, uh, essay. Number 10, autodidactism. And then number six, cultivate an interdisciplinary mind. So. Let, let me start with autodidactism. To be an autodidact is to learn for yourself, basically. Not to be told what to learn and what to look for and therefore study for it and give an exam. Da, 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 da. Basically, anti the way we all learn. <laughs> Anti-school is fundamentally what it is. But he's, he's not saying, you know, fuck school and fuck uni and all that stuff. What he's actually saying is to learn something properly and to go down the learning path 
and to fundamentally get to a point where you're comfortable with what you've learned and you've gone through the your own time and process of processing it is the best way to actually learn anything. He says this quote, which is really good. He says, I've never understood why the debate our education has focused so heavily on the type of school, so private, public, parochial, or charter, etc. Shouldn't we be more concerned about the quality of education? As it turns out, the quality can be good or bad in any of the different types of schools. We're missing the personalization of education that makes people want to learn because their learning path is tailored to their experience. This is really, really important. Your ability to learn, everyone's ability to learn is different. Like there's different types of learners. There's like kinesthetic and like movement type learners as well. Like you can't expect a singular system to be able to teach you. So if you think you're stupid, well, you're not. The majority of the people listening to this probably of a sound enough uh, mental state to call themselves smart. But this actually, for me, is more important once you leave school because I think a lot of people fall down the the road to specialization pretty quickly because they go down a specific job. That job then requires them to do specific things. And outside of that time, you don't have much time to do anything else and learn anything different. So you lose your autodidactism, i.e. Your, your ability to learn shit for yourself. And I'll tell you why that's anti-mimetic by linking it to his number six, which is cultivate an interdisciplinary mind. The reason why doing this is really important is because everything in our society, everything about life is linked. Like you can't be a science person or you can't be like a tech person and it not and not see the repercussions of your work into broader domains, right? So let's take the example of, I don't know, some like tech company doing something stupid and it becoming a political issue, uh, <coughs> Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook. So, and you can't like gloss over that fact. You have to have an interdisciplinary mind because in order to build something as big that as something like in a tech world you could build, so for example, Facebook, you have to maintain an integrity to yourself in order to be a polymath, in order to be someone that can do multiple things and understand the impact of their decisions, especially when we're working with tech and products that are ultimately limitlessly scalable. So if you're talking about social networks, I mean, this is why they've had, there's been so many fucking problems with social networks. And actually, interestingly enough, side note, uh, since Russia hasn't been able to, to access some of the US or UK based or Western, Western based uh, sites, the amount of trolling that's happened on social media has really decreased. Now, I'm not saying Russia is responsible for it, but I'm just saying that the impact of building something like Twitter is worldwide felt. And if everyone doesn't have the same thoughts as you, which is highly likely, you're going to end up in a situation which you were not prepared for. I think this builds on Luke's view of uh, religion as well, because he talks about the connections between Athens, Jerusalem, and Silicon Valley. Athens being reason, Jerusalem being religion, and uh, technology, so Silicon Valley being technology. There is an interlink with everything. So what you need to do is be aware of different things, Le want to learn, be an autodidact, learn different shit, but then also use that learning and broaden that learning so that you are understanding the decision, how, how the decisions you make in society are impacting others and impacting society itself. These points, essentially, they link back to the whole anti-fragile concept of Talib, which yep. is developing, out, or I've mentioned it a zillion times, or Cal Newport, rare and valuable skills, which is... <laughs> Become a trot. It's become a meme at this point. I think that there must be some memes floating around. <laughs> take a simple idea and take it seriously, Charlie Munger. There's yeah. Like, <laughs> you're just. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say you're in tech and you know how to code, but you also know like product management. You also know how to sell. You also know design. You know like the basic things of writing well, copy, maybe a bit of SEO. You have all of these skills up your you know, sleeve. You will never, ever be out of a job. If the world goes to shit, you'll be an extremely in-demand person. And a great example of an autodidact in the industry, and there's not many of them really, to be honest. Maybe there are, there are more now young kids, but in our generation, very rare, is Stevie Graham. Um, but he set up this startup, Teller, which is a competitor of Pled, which is, I think they, they do open banking protocols or APIs. And he raised funding from Founders Fund a few years ago. He made some comments previously and I, and I tweeted back. I said, okay, what do you reckon? Because he was talking about people who are going from being technical to learning sales, how to do it, because he knows how to do both, he taught himself. I said, what about if you're going from the business side to the technical side, like I'm doing? And he was like, I would read a lot more open source code. And this is someone who's been in the trenches, he's done the time, 
and he's um, doing very well for himself now. And I think he's just getting started. But point being with all of this, like there are very few people I see like him who have got to where they are because of going against convention, going against following this dreaded path, this bullshit path of, you know, following uni, you go into the McKinsey, Bain, BCG or consulting or investment banking, and then you go into the something else. And then you, you're just following a bullshit track. This guy on Harvard Business Review years ago wrote this article on optionality, referring to consultants and bankers who go to top unis, then go to I investment banking or consulting. Then they go do the Harvard MBA for two years. Then they go to private equity or VC. And he's like, this is just a bullshit path because you're keeping so many options open. And I, th in my view, optionality after the age of 30 is actually very dangerous. Actually, Odin asked me to give, give a talk on, they have the, the, these collective intelligence type groups where you give a talk on anything that interests you. Just a bunch of nerds get together and we talk. And I was going to give a speech, which I've delayed actually, because as I said, we're very busy these days, but I was going to give a talk on the concept of religion. Talev has a paper on religion which we'll also link in the show notes I sent you the other day. The paper by Talib is called Religion, Heuristics, and Intergenerational Risk Management. The reason I'm discussing all of this, and you mentioned actually religion as well, and it all links back together very, very nicely, all of this stuff, is it reduces you going off track. It's, it's somewhat of a risk management tool. As Talib concludes in this paper, it is not just that religion is a helpful source of sound heuristics for resisting gambler's ruin and similar hazards. More strongly, we should say that we humans actually don't know whether human beings can live sustainably without something like religion. Modernity is in the sense a dangerous, uncontrolled experiment. Given that the amount of time that we have sought as societies as a species to live without religion is almost nil, it is a symptom of chronic short-termism and over-optimism that people now assume that living in such a way is sustainable. So going back to your point as well and linking it all back uh, to optionality, I think one thing that religion does very nicely, maybe not with regards to your career, but generally life, is to reduce optionality. Similarly with saying going this whole IB track and then following this dreaded corporate path, that's dangerous because it's giving you too much optionality. So humans don't actually know what to do with too many options. And what they should be rather doing is, I think by the age of 30, figured out a path to stick to and follow. But if that is a path like, let's say tech, then you develop these rare and valuable skills. So you you learn how to learn as as, as some of us like to say, which is, independently without having to follow a path without having something laid out for you by your teachers your lecturers your corporate managing director without all of these charlatans you actually have a path which is not clear paul millard talks about the pathless path you just or danny there's so many people now online this, this cool niche of people on twitter like daniel vasalo who's like I quit my job, didn't really know what I was doing, but within six months I was earning income because I have a portfolio of small bets. You have a bunch of things on the go at the same time. You take a risk and in the process, you're learning a shit ton. That is essentially autodidactism in its essence. And the, I'm trying to sum my point up here, but it's a bunch of shit that kind of interconnects or comes together. One is reducing optionality. Two is the ability to learn, learn how to learn and develop rare and valuable skills and, you know, having a portfolio of small bets on the go. All of this really will make you, in my view, anti-fragile, which is if there are shocks, systemic shocks or whatever, you you will be, in my view, protected against these. If not, you will actually, it's, it's the opposite of protection. You will actually flourish and do better compared to everyone else because of how you've structured everything around you. I agree with everything you've said. The only thing I challenge is the point on religion, because religion in and of itself is mimetic, right? Everybody wants to go to heaven in, in the Christian sense or uh, on the Abrahamic sense. You're all following the same thing and doing the same thing. Now, that's a little bit different because he's got a point, which I think is number four in his list, seek positive mimesis, which is essentially, you don't just be that dickhead that, always wants to be contrarian and i think this is where um, a lot of people you know dislike peter Thiel because at like at some point just being different from the crowd just becomes not a positive part of your personality you can be mimetic in certain parts of your life it's positive to be mimetic in certain things and he raises the the example of the rule of saint benedict where saint benedict wrote a set of rules for community living and that's like what 1500 years old so it fits into the telebian 
Lindy values as well. Luke calls this the best anti-mimetic handbook ever written, which is big praise. Because to your point, it pick, it removes optionality from your life and it inserts specifically positive models for emulation. And what that does is fundamentally it just speeds up your process to being comfortable and being happy in life, which I think is, is is basically the most important thing that religion gives people. You essentially enter this, what he calls a positive flywheel of desire. In other words, how one desire affects subsequent desires and leads you towards a goal. So fitness is an example he gives. And, you know, if you're forcing yourself to, to be more fit, then that's actually a good thing because it's a, it's a reinforcing element of, in and of itself. And it helps you reframe goals. So your goal would start as just losing a few pounds to then becoming really, really fit to then squatting 200 kilograms to then like it, it's a consistent flywheel of positivity, as he calls it. It is definitely religion is mimetic. But at the same time, it's as you pointed out, he's. He says that this is positive mimesis. An article which I really like is Simon Saris in Praise of the Gods, What the Rationalistic World Forgot. And he touches on all of this. We'll link this as well in the show notes. But in a nutshell, yes, in my view, it's positive mimesis. And it's the form of mimesis which is actually required and needed because if there, if there are not a bunch of underlying positive principles or risk management principles then humans all naturally go off trail because common sense is uncommon. So what's, what's another one you like? Return anger with kindness. A, a good example of this is when I was younger, like 10 years ago, I'd obviously have a little bit of road rage, you know, uh, honking <laughs> the horn or whatever. Someone's just clearly in the wrong. It's not, you know, I, I'm very rational. So if they're in the wrong recently, if there's any, any issue, let's say someone's even beeping at me or they're like, they're going crazy. they <laughs> Top speeding down. with the top down <laughs> top down in the winter that's what winners do hove so in the last few years every time something like this has happened firstly like the road rage is gone secondly if someone does try to honk at me or shout or swear whatever they do it's literally the best reaction in the world it's something i got in the habit of doing and it's so fun you basically just smile and wave and like this <laughs> And they're, and they're shocked and they don't know what to do. I remember once this guy as well, he just, you could tell he's like a corporate dad, like a really just good man going about his life, raising his kids. And he just pulled out in front of me because he was probably stressed and late or whatever. And a normal reaction would have been like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, why are you pulling out in front of me? I was, I was going to write your car off and probably kill you and your kid. And the way he was extremely like apologetic instantly made me drop my guard. I was like, oh shit. And then you're like, yeah, maybe he's having a bad, maybe something's like going wrong with him. Or in, in the end, uh, you don't take any of this with you without getting extremely deep. It's really all about love and unification and humanity. So Chuck's Knox Mox. Chuck's. But I mean, that's, that's based on his second one as well, right? He talks about forgive someone and then repeat, keep forgiving people. This is really important in the context of a Macy's. And I'll explain why you honk in your horn and then while well, people <laughs> honking their horn at you and you smiling and waving. Uh, is actually a really good thing in terms of being anti-mimetic is because, like I said earlier, there's this negative cycle that occurs when you're inside a mimetic process. What happens to break that cycle? Someone finds a scapegoat and you blame, the blame shifts on this one person. You go through a series of rituals as a society to remember that blaming process and move on from it, right? The problem is people don't remember this shit. And the problem is you end up always blaming people. Well, actually, what you should always try to do is forgive, because if you try to forgive, you're actually breaking that cycle of mimesis already. So you're not getting to the scapegoat part where a poor soul, soul ends up being, you know, put to the stake. So he quotes one of Gerard's books. So I think the final book that Gerard wrote was called The Scapegoat. And he writes, the time has come for us to get to forgive one another. If we wait longer, there will be no, there will not be enough time. So if you continue going through these negative cycles and you can continue to shout at people when you're driving and, and, and getting angry when they honk at you for stupid stuff or when they pull out with their kid in front of the car, you're, you're fundamentally getting to a point where you're going to break. You're going to break yourself and you need to be able to like step back, figure out, fuck, I need to forgive, forgive someone. And that helps you move forward. That helps you find your path. That helps you enter a non-mimetic cycle that then hopefully takes you further forward as opposed to being something that keeps you in this fucking this fucking loop yeah another point he raises which actually ties everything very nicely what we discussed earlier point five he says the marriage of anti-mimetic and anti-fragility anti-mimetic does not mean anti-fragile but there are correlations mimesis is generally fragile think of stock market bubbles 
While antimimesis is generally not as fragile, for example, a person with wide learning across many disciplines and a variety of friends across the political spectrum is going to be far less likely to fall into a cult than someone who is totally clustered with horse blinders on. And he goes on on and on, recommends reading Antifragile, ends with the point is this, becoming more antimimetic necessarily makes one more antifragile. And I think it ties everything we mentioned earlier nicely regarding the antifragile stuff and even to do with being able to learn by yourself, uh, developing skills, reducing optionality. Not Okay, so here's the thing. When people say reducing optionality, they're like, but I thought it's all about having a portfolio of small bets. It's contradictory. It's completely separate. Uh, You reduce options in the forms of options which have the risk of ruin. And to me, a corporate path is the risk of ruin. Not, let's say, not being married is a risk of ruin because then, you know, you don't have a familial purpose or let's say doing drugs, drinking, all of these, all of these kind of things which have the risk of ruin or gambling, which Taleb talks about in his religion paper, gambler's ruin, as he calls, or other moral hazards. These are bad. Therefore, having a set of values or principles, a la religion, which reduces this is good, but If you're talking about, okay, your career, let's say within a career scope, then the best example of how one should live in my view is, let's say someone like Daniel Vasalo, who has a portfolio of small bets. So he makes money by freelancing as a software engineer. So for context, he left his job as a software engineer at Amazon. He was making half a million a year. And now he just freelances software engineering a few hours a week, like maybe five or 10 hours a week. He's a quarter time head of product at Gumroad with Sahil. He sells a th- two or three courses on Gumroad on like how to grow your Twitter audience or whatever. Very cheap courses, like $25, but very high in sales volume. So he's made like, I think, half a million alone just from these courses or something ridiculous in a very short time span. All bootstrapped, all literally zero upfront cost. And the reason it's a portfolio of small bets is because it'll take him like a few days to just put this product out. He's not really launching a company, spending his life on it. So he'll spend a few days on each product, just like Amazon, AWS and Prime make up most of the revenues, but everything else fails, as we previously said. With him, he may try 50 things. Three of them bring up enough revenue for like half a decade to live on or more. But it's things which have low commitment, going back to the whole asymmetrical returns or whatever, and low downside, but potentially very high upside. And so this is, in my view, the correct way one should live, not with regards to most things to do with career, to be honest. And so in that regard, optionality is fantastic. If you are a finance trading nerd, then that's a separate point. Uh, Taleb talks about optionality, which is essentially how he made his money anyway back in the day. That's a separate point, but that's one example. But if you're talking about how to live life itself, uh, aside from career, then no, optionality is gambler's ruin and moral hazard, in my view. I'm going to overlay some gunshot noises because I think that's a good way to end. You've uh, sent some facts into the ether. Essentially, yeah. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Actually, a great way to end point eight by Luke on this article. Speak the truth. Speak the truth in accord with your conscience, no matter what the cost. (laughs) Rationalvc.com. Chucks. Do not like this video. Do not subscribe to us. Do not read the essays. You do not deserve them. They're free. If anything, we should be putting up a paywall soon. That's my outro pitch. Thanks for the one viewer who still tunes into YouTube and the one Thank listener you. who still listens. We will be back to regular cadence in a few months. And uh, in the meantime, enjoy the one episode or maybe two per month that we put out. But we still try and get the essays out once a month. Shout out Luke Burgess. Thank you for writing some cool shit. Luke, Luke uh, is a yeah. phenomenal thinker and um, writer and just all around human being. And so... We will have him on the podcast at some point for sure. It'll be a pleasure to have him on. Chucks. Chucks.